assembling for our final talk. And the best part about this talk, well, maybe not the best part, but one thing, a, a nice little uh, trick about this talk is that our guest, our presenter today is actually tomorrow. What's up, Mon? How you doing? Ooh, hi. <laughs> Sorry, that's my dog at the back. Um, Your dog hi, wants yes, to go out. It's uh, tomorrow for me. So it is 16, then it is, it is late for you too. Yeah. Wait, what time? So you're in Australia. We're just going to say that right now. You're going to, you're going to take us home starting your day. We're finished. I'm finishing mine. There's a lot of people in California that are uh, just finishing up lunch, I believe. But what, uh, what time is it where you are? It is 8, 10 a.m. So it's a good, decent, it's a decent time. Yeah, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. Eight, that's respectable. I am glad that I didn't like give you a time that was 3 a.m. or anything like that. So we did all right. Anyway, you've come to talk to us about some really awesome stuff. I just saw your screen, but now I don't see it anymore. What happened? You might have to share it again. Ooh, let me try. <laughs> That's the fun part. Yeah. Ooh. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Uh, if it makes you feel any better, I'll tell you the stories that I, uh, I have these big lights right next to me. And I didn't realize that the last like hour there i see your screen now for the last like hour i've had my window open and so now i've got these gigantic bugs that are just flying around so in case you see me swatting while i'm talking to you that is uh because i've got these gigantic bugs flying in my ears anyway i'm gonna leave it to you you're gonna take us home bring it on strong and let's see uh i'll be back in like 10 minutes Thanks, thanks, and nice to see you back again. So yeah, thanks for having me. Um, all right, so um, I will be going through a little bit of my our journey of building code completion tools within GitLab. I am an engineering manager who looks at a um, group called Model Ops, and um, we started this journey on building code completions through uh, through a tool called Code Suggestions. Uh, pretty much around four, six, seven months, and uh, and yeah, we've learned a lot through it, and um, and just want to uh, share through all the learnings together. So, um, before we go into exactly what code completion tools do or not do, um, or the architecture of it, code completion tools, what they are, they write, complete, recommend the code you want. Um, it is fundamentally very, very close to the heart of any developer in using AI as assistance in decision making for developers uh, to help them provide that judgment. There's a lot of talks on how do you use it, what do you consider it usable, what part do you augment. But in general, when you are deciding on the outcomes of these LLMs for code completions, um, there's basically three areas. Um, will this code that a AI assistant uh, completion uh, agent or recommendation uh, be honest, um, which is consistent with facts? This is beyond just evaluating for is the code correct? Is this honest to the developer who is developing? Is this harmless? And is it actually helpful? So accomplishing exactly the goal of the coder. So the coder can code fast and instead of writing 500 lines can actually write 1000 lines of code for a usable feature. Um, so um, that's sort of what a code completion tool and how we actually decide on LLMs and based on these outcomes of these three different metrics. Now, I want to actually focus on the last part. Does it actually help um, to get to the uh, the goal of the coda? Um, to do that, I do want to talk about how you a framework on how you can do evaluator, billing and decision time framework to make these uh, LLMs in uh, production useful. Um, 
And keeping in mind a lot of the LLMs, um, other than uh, ChatGPT, whether it's third party or 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 um, or um, or open source, um, we don't necessarily constantly feed feed them the training data of uh, to judge the quality of the good, bad, and ugly. So then, how do you actually then take these third party open source LLMs, make them write code that are much better than an average coder can actually do? So that's sort of a goal that we want to achieve together. Um, okay, so some fun fundamentals, obviously, of choosing the right raw uh, raw LLMs, um, as we probably call it. Um, things we want to look at is obviously the objective is code completions, uh, code generation, recommendations code uh, for developers. So this is all probably everybody by now probably has a better sense. We want to look into the parameters, uh, the training data. This is really, really important uh, to just get a sense of just on a raw side, uh, how much data, how much of the internet has been gone into, into this, um, uh, building this model and getting some smarts into this prediction machine. Um, when you go through a completion uh, tool, we want to look into what kind of ev evaluation benchmarks are already there with the LLMs that you've chosen. Um, if it is open source, uh, we want to understand the model weights, are this flexible, what kind of tuning uh, frameworks can we do, uh, or even for third party. Um, cost is obviously another thing, and latency. I see a lot of posts where we say we want to also assess quality, but I do think that this is a really hard one on how you can actually assess quality without really evaluating in end scale. And, and, and how do you actually then use these efforts of work on prompt engineering at scale and do almost like continuous training, continuous prompt engineering. So to get to that, I do want to first look into what an LLM architecture from a perspective can look like where you basically in this world of LLMs, you're not just choosing one, you're choosing many based on the factors we discussed before. And let's say you have an open source pre-trained LLM that you can also feed in further data to tune it. And then you also have certain third-party um, LLMs as well. And what you're then doing a full architecture of starting from the left, you're taking the data, additional data to enhance your pre-trained LLMs. You're downloading, let's say from Hugging Face, wherever, full raw data sets, partitioning, pre-processing, tokenizing, all the way into an environment where you're training it, tuning it, having those layers of checkpoints. Then it goes further into what we, there's two engines running parallelly into it is also then the prompt engine almost, where you are instantly with every code a person has written, you're going through the same layer of what we call a prompt library or a prompt DB of then looking into how do you deconstruct that code into tokens, uh, understand what was then finally committed, uh, and then get a better sense of a scoring mechanism of ranking. Is this a good average good developer understanding? And then going into some sort of a gateway where we have a prompt engine, post-processing, a validator, um, calling the models based on the input the user is doing, whether it's through the third party or, or actually through, uh, through your pre-trained model. Um, now, the orange boxes are something we'll, we'll go through in the next few slides as well as to how do you actually have a continuous evaluation and inference as part of this architecture. So, focusing on the evaluation, um, how do you kind of do it in scale? Um, without the human eval benchmarks uh, and starting with that, and let's say you've started that and you've also done a uh, few more of a uh, uh, few short examples uh, and you've done a little bit of user base and then you want to understand how to 
version control it, scale it, do it continuously, have a CI, CD, continuous training, continuous feedback to consistently keep on dialing up the accuracy for your use case. Um, now, to do that, those orange boxes on the left is a way we would probably have a mechanism to continuously loop that, which would include prompt inputs to tokenizing, to understanding the similarity based on a developer, to storing it, to evaluating it, and then using that as a smart to, uh, to actually have the output. For example, let's say we have on a historic database, uh, we've dissected a large model code to understand a token of completion, what a, uh, uh, to, to understand how you build an XGVS model. Now, we've seen that historically in a code base of a company uh, that many developers have developer one, developer two, developer three, like that. Um, they have different ways of writing the same code. They have different uh, parameters, evaluations, and everything. And then what we've done is we've ran these algorithm based on the code commit and similarity and agreed on what is an actual agreeable developer output. Um, that then is then evaluated with how the LLMs, open source third party tuned, uh, is outputting through a technique uh, based on the objective, we've used cosine similarities, you can use Pearsman or however, based on the prompt as well as the code through. Um, now this engine, so the prompt is here, model XGB, we then know what an actual agreeable developer output should look like to understand how to map that to a quality. And then we know how each of these elements are giving uh, outputting it and matching that and then sending the right output uh, to to the right uh, uh, to the to the user. Now this makes probably sense in just one line and a lot of times I see people having manual spreadsheets to looking into prompts and how to evaluate it. but imagine this having this in scale as engines. And that's the beauty of having this sort of a microservice engines added to your layer of full architecture where you can do this in an infinite loop on an instant basis to keep on dialing, let's say your code completion uh, usefulness um, to uh, harm uh, harmfulness, usefulness, all the benchmarks and an instantaneously keep on um, helping with uh, with the evaluation part of it. So this is something that can help just doing it at scale a thousand times for in that continuous fashion. Now on the serving then is basically what we call in the reinforcement learning of it. So imagine from that evaluation, then we go into, yes, we know what is the actual data We know what the LLMs are giving. Now we want to know if there are prompt templates of prompt tunings that we can do on an instant basis, have a prompt validator, rate limiter, output. If that can't be done, stranded it to a fine tuning of the LLMs. Again, continuous loop, having it version-based, control-based. Each of these can be microservice connected through uh, CI and uh, having that prompt validator, rate limiter, becomes a key to really understand the user input as well as the output to then put that full continuous loop where you may start on the fact that at a certain level, you've started on the raw LLMs of a combination, giving you a 10% acceptance rate for coders. Then you sort of take this evaluation benchmark and then continuous prompting through reinforcement learning in a loop. And just like an Amazon recommendation engine, you're constantly dialing up this accuracy of usability uh, to, to then get to that output. So then let's go back again now, putting that inference and the prompt of how this whole becomes that loop. Training data, completion data, 
continuously. And with code completion, you will always have code. There will always be a coder writing code. So you can continuously add this and keep on adding to this data for evaluation, for prompt inference, for ranking, for understanding what is what is how, what are those three decision time frames? How does that impact every code to get better in using LLMs for um, code completion? Um, that's all I actually have today. Um, I do want to end by saying that it is uh, if one of my lines that in this day and age of elements, data is still the oil. It is very difficult to imagine this that with sufficient data, there will remain things that only humans can do. So uh, in the journey of LLMs, this is still the key. This has not changed. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I haven't put my details here, but I can put it on the chat. Of If any anyone has questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me in the MLR Slack community uh, channel, as well as on LinkedIn. There we go. All right, Mon, thank you so much. That is so cool and so valuable. I love to hear this journey and I appreciate you sharing it with us and being very transparent. And now you get to go off and enjoy your day while we, hopefully it's sunny where you are. I know it is, uh, it is winter, right? <laughs> That's another It thing. is. So maybe you're getting a nice winter day and we are going to close the party for now but we'll be back in action tomorrow same place same time and we've got a whole nother lineup uh but in case anyone would like to know i will be singing more songs i, I know you will you probably want to know i'm on i i will have more songs you missed it because you were probably sound asleep but i created a few improvised songs and now uh Hopefully, I'll, I'll sing us all a lullaby and put us to sleep, <laughs> and we will get out of here. Uh, actually, no lullaby. I'm ready to go to sleep right now, to be honest. My brain has stopped functioning. I'm calling it quits. I'll see everybody tomorrow. And Mon, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.